Hello, welcome to Only For Your Ears. In today's episode four, we will look at the folklore of the love story of the Taj Mahal. It's originally named A Teardrop on the Cheek of Time, which I have renamed A Love for the Ages. The structure will be the same as usual. One, I'll start with a short summary to highlight the important points. Two, a critical review on how this story plays in society today. And three, the trigger points. Let's begin. A love for the ages. The Taj Mahal is a majestic monument situated in Northern India. It was built to function as a mausoleum that housed two famous lovers, Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. Shah Jahan was a 17th century Mahal ruler. It is said he built this mausoleum shortly after his beloved wife died while giving birth to his 14th child. I digress here, people. I can only imagine the wear and tear on a woman's body after one child, let alone 14 births. The story goes that they were so in love and this was how lovers showed their deep feelings for each other. I disagree. Even though I understand the sentiments of being so deeply in love with someone, like you almost want to possess every part of them. I think it was a you complete me love moment, but I think it's going too far in regards to considering the welfare of the woman's body. Even today, most men, don't take this into consideration while thinking about expanding their offspring, but not all. Shah Jahan was spotted, spotted Mamataz in a bazaar at Agra selling silks and beads. The young prince fell madly in love with this Persian aristocrat. Shah Jahan was steadfast in his pursuit of Mamataz for five years. Shah Jahan married Mumtaz in 1612. Although Mumtaz has been immortalized as a paragon of feminine beauty, she's also recognized as a astute and accomplished politician practitioner like many imperial Mughal women before her. Jahan entrusted the royal seal to his wife as she worked side by side with the emperor and often accompanied him on the battlefield of war. Shahjahan bestowed upon her the greatest degree of love because of her unusual charm, sincerity and pleasing manners. Queen Mamataz Mahal was noted for her many fine accomplishments and her sincere sympathy for the poor and distressed and destitute. She expressed she was an empress, Nor Norijan's daughter-in-law. Mamaha possessed divine charm and extraordinary gift of common sense and intelligence and had a major say in the administration during the reign of Shah Jahan. She was the chief advisor of Shah Jahan and the seal authority was always in her possession. I digress again, people. I would say in a lot of ways, he was quite a progressive man, especially in his relationship to Mama Taz. He wasn't at all threatened by her achievements. In fact, he was in awe of them. When his father died, Prince Quran ascended to the throne in, in, 20, in 1627 and was named Shah Jahan's Mahal Emperor Shah Jahan conferred the title of Mamataz Mahal onto another royalty in the line to the throne. This beautiful and mentally alert Lady stood by Shah Jahan even through the tough times. 
she continued to be a faithful and beloved assistant to Shashahan, even for those eight long years when Shashahan was made to quit the empire for his father and was truly homeless. This goes to amplify her sterling character that she was not only beautiful and efficient lady, but was also a fully dedicated housewife. So even through her title, even though her title was discussed, she demonstrated the utmost loyalty to her husband. Mamataz Mahal spent 18 years of married life with Shah Jahan. During this period, she solved many administrative problems and gave a good account of her presence of mind. She was also popular for her social welfare activities. She did a good job for the widows and orphans. She was regarded as a good refuge for all of those who were really distressed and poor. Mama Taz Mahal gave birth to 14 children. She fell seriously ill at the time of her 14th delivery. At that time, Shah Jahan was engaged in a war. Every effort was made to save Mamataz Mahal, but to no avail. At last, thinking her end to be closer, she transferred the responsibility of Shah Jahan's care to her eldest daughter. Shah Jahan gave word on behalf of Mamataz request to erect a befitting memorial for her, the beauty of which would continue to be cherished in the world for ages. Mamataz Mahal died thereafter, leaving Shah Jahan alone and sulking for the rest of his life. I digress here, people, just a little bit. I believe she wanted Shah Jahan to know that she con would continue to love him forever, even from the grave. Soon after the death of Mamataz Mahal, Shah Jahan announced a memorial to be erected in loving memory of his queen. And finally, the Taj Mahal was built. The Taj Mahal is a symbol of love between Shah Shah Jahan and Mamataz Mahal. Shah Jahan could hardly bear this grievous personal loss and began to decline. In utter agony, he gave up the royal dress and started wearing white clothes. He was now no longer interested in the durbar and other related royal functions. In his old age, Shah Jahan was kept as a prisoner by his own son. It was said there was an excellent view of the Taj Mahal from the prison cell, and Shah Jahan used to sit there and look at the Taj Mahal for hours. After the death of Shah Jahan, his dead body was buried beside Mamataz in the Taj Mahal. Thus, he joined his beloved from whom he had long been separated for more than 36 years. What a wonderful, heart-moving story. And now for a critical review of how the folklore plays in society today. Well, I think this story amplifies true love, which is quite different from the general consensus of how true love is illustrated today. To pursue someone for five years after spotting Mamataz in a market selling beads and silk says a lot. The many levels of steadfastness and dedication to their love were evident when Mamataz stayed with Shah Jahan in riches and in poverty and how she demonstrated the loyalty to her husband Let's look at some sentences that help frame this review. This beautiful and mentally alert lady stood by Shah Jahan even during tough times. 
This reminds me of a couple our family knew in England. They were from Jamaica and they were quite an industrious couple. They had their own printing firm. And back in the day, around that time, it was very unusual to see couples, especially a West Indian couple, in business of their own. Her husband ended up going to prison for three, three times in a row for about four or five years a time. His wife never complained and or spoke evil of him. She had three children and the middle child looked after the company for her parents until he, the father, came out of prison. No matter how many problems they had as a couple, their steadfast devotion to each other and their family was breathtaking. It was commendable. In fact, when my mother got remarried and moved into my stepdad's house, it was right next door to this couple. Really noteworthy because these challenges in their marriage were happening at the same time my parents' marriage had definitively crumbled like a bulldozer knocking down a Roman ruin. It's truly amazing how I forgot about this couple as a role model, which was diminished by my parents, who unfortunately left a bad taste in my mouth in regards to relationships. I'm reminded of the great Dame Margot Fontaine, a beautiful principal ballet dancer of the Royal Ballet back in the day, but now it's called the British Royal Company. She got married late in her 40s to an Argentine politician. And six months after they were married, he was gunned down and paralyzed from the neck down. She had, she had an assistance, of course, but he couldn't do anything. He couldn't even speak. She fed him and spoke to him. She'd go and do her performances and go home to him. And all those years, colleagues that knew her said she never complained. So these examples are absolutely so encouraging. Mamta's did a good job for the widows and orphans. Michelle Obama comes to mind, as well as Eleanor Roosevelt, who both demonstrated great compassion and empathy to the military. Michelle Obama threw her hat in the ring and devoted a lot of time and care to widows, especially military wives. Dame Eleanor Roosevelt became even more beloved than her husband was because of her tireless sense of justice in regard to the military and civil rights issues. She unabashedly fought for her women's rights and racial injustice. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution, DAR, refused to let Marian Anderson, an African-American opera singer, perform in Constitution Hall. So Eleanor resigned her membership in DAR and arranged the concert at the nearby Lincoln Memorial. The event turned into a massive outdoor celebration attended by 75,000 people. She sure showed them. Mamtas was Shahjahan's queen and regarded as a good refuge for all those who were really distressed and poor. Being super rich or poor didn't seem to bother her. Her compassion, empathy, and loyalty kept his love, Mamtas, burning even beyond her passing. His love for her kept him alive into his old age, but his grief for her made him sick. Mamtaz may have been maybe a little stronger than Shahjahan. He certainly treated her as his equal. And back 
in the 16th century when women were supposed to be subservient, to say the least. I find myself reflecting on President Obama, who's a very, very strong man, and First Lady Michelle Obama. President Obama wasn't afraid of his wife's strength and power. In fact, he allowed her to exude that power in all its natural essence. She was immensely loved in the United States and is even more popular than her husband, who doesn't seem to mind at all. And now for the trigger points. The trigger points, I'll just give you a brief explanation of what a trigger is. A trigger is, I, I would say, a memory, a reminder of a past event, trauma, or addiction, a condition that we once were in, in the past. And in the present, our re, in our present reality, that memory comes back to tap us on the shoulder and remind us, oh, tap, tap, tap. Remember when you were a drug addict? Remember that day? Remember when you had so many problems? Remember that? And if we're not strong within ourselves, what happens is that we go back. We slowly start to tiptoe, tiptoe back to that particular situation. And in what I'm, when I want to talk about the triggers, I want to say that we have choices, people. We have, we have the power of choice to either go back to the past or we have the power of choice to decide, I recognize it's a trigger. This is not my reality today. And I will continue to go forward. Recognize the trigger and move forward. So let's take a look at some of the triggers that took place in this story for me and for other people. Okay, first trigger. The Pope was triggered by the Affordable Health Care Act birth control law for religious women working in religious institutions. Pope, the Pope metaphorically slapped President Obama when he visited the Vatican. He politely handed him some a box of seeds and herbs, then sat him down and said he didn't approve of the provisions made in the ACA allowing women to have equal rights to birth control as other women did. This really triggered me as I was raised Catholic. And at the end of that same year, the Pope looked at his congre congregation and saw the aftermath of the failure of Catholicism implementing the rhythm method as a form of birth control hadn't worked. The Pope saw the large families and the tired mothers and said, quite fran frankly, you don't have to have babies like rabbits. Although Mamatas loved her children, it wasn't necessary to give birth to so many children to convey love and devotion. This was an eye-opening remark coming from an, instit an institution that has upheld the type of ineffective policy. Talk about facing the trigger and moving forward. Good for him. The next trigger, well, it's quite personal. Okay, this trigger is very close to home. I had a male friend I knew for about 10 years from the church that I attended before we started hanging out a bit, just as friends, but he was edging for more. But I kept on avoiding this because I was just looking for a friend. Well, as soon as I gently let him know that I was, I just wanted to be friends, I can hear the chit chat going through the ethers, okay? 
that I just wanted to be friends. Everybody wants that. Oh no, you friend zoned him. Of course I friend, friend zoned him. And if you stay for the rest of it, you'll understand why I friend zoned him. Yes. And no sooner had after, uh, uh, no sooner after I did that, his true colors emerged. He started talking about his former girlfriend he has a child with, you know, with a name similar to Jay Jr. And how he met her when she was closer to 40 years old and wasn't married and getting old. Like, what have you done? You're old. You don't have any children and you're not married. You're a failure. In other words, you haven't completed your principal mission as a woman. As if to say he knew what the principal mission of each woman on this planet is. As if to say men know the sole mission of a woman. He tried to berate and manipulate me for living my life. I wanted to be who I wanted to be. He even tried to put a spell on me and have me take honey and also like some black, black witchcraft stuff. The positive side was I wouldn't allow him to control me. Again, he tried to do all of those things to control, control, control. And I'm so proud of what I, what happened because I come from a narcissistic background. My mother was an undiagnosed narcissistic personality disorder. And so I was manipulated, brainwashed, gaslit all through my childhood into my early 20s. So I was really proud of myself for not taking the bait. I recognized what he was trying to do. I stayed strong and I continued to move, move forward and not allow him to define who I am as a person. The last one, the last trigger is how I was treated in Spain. Now, Spain is a Latin country and in a lot of Latin countries, the mentality is, you know, the wife stays at home and has children, has the offspring and looks after the house. She is the keeper of the house. Even today, back in Catalonia, you know, the husband comes home, takes some money out for himself and gives the rest of the paycheck to his wife. She pays the bills. She's the budget person. And when I was there, you know, uh, I was at the, the same church. This German woman came up to me. She said, how are you coping living here in Catalonia? Because everybody wants to know if you're married or if you're single or do you have any children? And if you don't, if you're not married and single, they automatically put you in a category that's befitting somebody that should be dead. Basically, you're an old maid. My sister had the same thing when she was in England. That's why she quickly got married when she was 30 years old. In Africa too, in the West Indies. So this type of mentality runs through not only different continents, but different races as well. The basic, so I can understand why my friend basically had this attitude. What's your purpose? Because the general consensus worldwide is that you're a woman, you deliver babies and you stay at home, metaphorically speaking. But things have changed remarkably for women in society. So, you know, I was looked down on. I was looked down on, looked as a failure. What's wrong with you? Maybe she's gay. You know, not, there's, not that there's anything wrong with being gay, but that's not who I am. But they wanted to come up with every kind of label that they wanted to. And I wouldn't budge. Black, single, straight, teacher, artistic, 
no children by the cat. And that's all I had. And they were just scratching their heads. They couldn't understand. And no matter how hard I tried to mind my own business, of course, and I tried to just be normal, just like a normal person. They just couldn't accept me. So it was very, very difficult, but I didn't budge. I stood my own ground. So that was another example of a trigger, something triggering me from the past, making me feel as though, oh, you know, you're a failure. I'm not a failure. I'm a very successful person and hopefully a successful professional person in my future. But these are the three triggers and I hope you enjoyed them. Well, this is the end of today's episode. And I'd like to just say, if you, you like the content, give me a thumbs up. You can also um, prescribe if you want to. It's subscribe, I should say. It's up to you. It doesn't cost you anything. And the end, at the end of this episode, I always say uh, a little phrase, and it goes like this. Healing is a lifelong gift we give ourselves, mind, body, and soul. Healing is a lifelong gift we give ourselves, mind, body, and soul. Goodbye, and stay blessed. <laughs>